Hello, everybody, and welcome to a new episode of BIM Pure Live. I am your host, Nicolas Catelier. I am an architect, a BIM specialist, and the founder of Revit Pure and BIM Pure. Uh, before moving on with today's special guest, uh, a couple of things to mention. But if you are watching live, please let us know in the comments where you are uh, watching from. Always interesting uh, to see. And a quick announcement. Um, Revit Pure is evolving into BIM Pure. Revit Pure started in 2016. Since then, uh, we've created multiple blog posts, videos, uh, and courses about Revit. But in on February 7, 2024, this year, it's evolving into uh, BIM Pure. You can see if currently it's on the Revit Pure website, the blog post explaining the evolution, what the new platform is going to contain. And if you go right now at bimpure.com, you can see the new landing page. It doesn't contain everything, but it's a little tease for what's to come. So this is going to be a subscription-based platform. It's going to be an annual subscription to get access to uh, everything, including the core Revit courses. Some of them already available on Revit Pure, but uh, slightly evolve, as well as a new course, Heroic Families, getting back, uh, coming back to Dex soon, including download, with the pro template, families collection, Dynamo script. And something new that I'm very excited about. So I will not officially announce them, but you can see a little tease over there. I'm working with fellow BIM masters for what is called the BIM master sessions. Uh, the idea is to have mini courses done in the style of BIM pure and the style of Revit pure, you know, for a while, uh, but with other people, these are mini courses of about one hour on various BIM topics that can be for Revit workflows, but also, as you can see in the little tease, it can be about culture and technology in the AC space. Very excited about that, but they're not going to be released initially. This is for later on. Uh, BIM Pure will also include a community board. Uh, and also, we're going to have, let me scroll down, uh, live sessions, a little bit like what we're doing right now on YouTube, but it's going to be uh, for the members. and. Since we're launching a new course about Revit families, we already have uh, four live master class master classes planned, three by myself and another one by Brenton Weiberg from RevitFamily.biz. And yeah, at the same time, this new platform is going to launch on February 7. We're going to launch a course called Herrick Families, which I've been working on for the last two years. This is about how to create amazing Revit families. Uh, you can get on the wait list right now. Uh, the URL is in the description of this video. So that is the new Herrick Families course uh, to learn how to create, like master some of hidden special tricks for Revit families, such as mastering the arrays, uh, the formulas, the nested families, the shared families, controlling the graphics, uh, adaptive components, lookup tables, uh, this contains a lot of case studies of families. So, bimpure.com and or revitpure.com, you can read the latest blog post. We have a small FAQ if you currently have courses on RivetPure to see what's going to happen to you. Pretty excited about that. And for those who are wondering, like the all the old posts are going to stay on the blog, are going to stay on RivetPure, uh, but the, the rest is going to move on to BIMPure. Okay, so I'm curious in the chat if you are, what you think about this, but it, this is, uh, I'm very happy about this because I've been working on this project for a very, very long time. Okay. Let's introduce today's guest. Today's guest is Marcelo Scambelleri. He's based in LA, you would say. Um, he's graduated from the University of Nevada in Reno in 1998 with a Master of Science in Civil Engineering. 
He's the Director of Advanced Design Technology at AG&E Structural Ingenuity since 2022. Before that, he worked at John A. Martin Associates of Nevada as Director of Advanced Technology for 25 years. Marcelo is now known in the industry for being an amazing Autodesk University speaker. He spoke uh, there and he won awards nine times since 2012. Uh, also spoke at other conferences such as Built and others. In 2021, he published a book called The Ni Dynamo and Grasshopper for Revit Cheat Sheet Reference Manual. Uh, welcome to the show, Marcelo. Thanks for having me, Nicholas. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. <laughs> yeah. 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 Staying busy, that's for sure. Uh, constantly learning new things, especially now with all this AI technology. Yeah. So, Have you been diving a lot into AI? I have, yeah, yeah. We could talk about it later on in the show. Uh, in fact, I do a webinar tomorrow. It'll be my fifth, my fifth talk on A, A AI and AEC. Uh -huh. uh, but yeah, the the bottom line is it's it's here to stay, and it's going to change what we do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, tell me, how did you get interested in BIM? Ooh, good one. Okay, so. Uh, what happened was, um, I was, when I graduated in 1998, it's been, yeah, it's been that long. Uh, I started working for a structural firm in downtown Los Angeles. And the first project I was put on was a project with Geary Partners, uh, called the Walt Disney Concert Hall. And at the time, uh, we could not convey all that geometry uh, which was these very curved shapes. Um, we couldn't do it through traditional, uh, basically drawings, plans and elevations. The only way we could convey that geometry to the contractor was to actually model it all in 3D. And so what happened was, uh, as this young engineer, I was forced to work in the software. The only software at the time that was available to do that geometry was a software by the air, from the airline industry. It was called <laughs> Katia by Dassault Systems. So that yeah. was the first 3D modeling program I ever learned. So, so um, what, what, she, what year was that? Around 98 or something like that? This was 1998, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so you work on the, well, yeah, that's a pretty well-known project, in fact, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I spent yeah. three years of my life on that project, actually. Uh, uh -huh. And what happened was it was, it was uh, right after the Northridge earthquake, the one in the valley. So... The, the whole concert hall was already designed for the county of LA uh, and um, all the steel was already ordered and sitting in a warehouse in Long Beach. So when we had to go back and design it, the the county didn't trust the moment frames anymore, the lateral system. So we had mm -hmm. to redesign it based on how they performed in the Northridge earthquake. We had to turn it into, into brace frames. So we had to basically take all this steel. It was a bit complicated to work that into the geometry, but it was a lot of fun. So that was basically my first experience with BIM. Uh, it wasn't called BIM at the time, although we did have smart intelligent elements built into the software uh, because it was modified quite a bit. Uh, uh, Gary's, uh, Frank Gary's office did that for us and then we were able to use these smart elements. So it was, let's call it BIM-ish <laughs> at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, and then I immediately moved to another project which was called the Status Center at MIT, which is also another freight Geary project, which which is also has a lot of curved geometry. I worked three years of my life on that project as well. So I was kind of basically thrown right into the fire uh, of working in 3D constantly and, and intelligent elements. And so my brain always worked. That's how we have to convey geometry. That's how we have to work is always in 3D, always in uh, smart elements, always conveying and passing this type of information back and forth through non-traditional means. Uh, and and so that's how I was brought into it. What was interesting to me was, uh, even though we had this such a sophisticated system, it was even the the 3D models were even the contract documents. So they were they were sent to the contractor. The contractor loaded into their total station. The surveyors would go out, shoot points, and then erect the the steel, etc. Um, the the governing bodies that had to check all of the designs still required everything to be in 2D. Mm -hmm. So we had to do kind of these backward gymnastics to get to try to convey everything, not from so it's buildable, but enough to describe uh, how it's designed and our intention to the building department so they could go and do their checks. So that was actually interesting. And that was a bit eye opening to me, which which made me realize that 
as, as, as fast as you can move, there's always going to be, uh, you know, you're always as slow as your weakest link, but, but that's where, that's where it all started. And so I just, I basically was just the one who would, would work on these, these 3d projects, these come more non rectilinear 3d projects. And so <laughs> when Revit came around, uh, and our office started to adopt it in 2005 or so, uh, I was basically tasked to help implement that. And I was kind of the go-to BIM manager. And so I started switching roles from being a full-time designer, structural engineer to half design, structural engineer, half, half, uh, half BIM manager. So that's kind of how, that's how I ended up getting into it. So, yeah. So you've always, from what I hear, you're used to kind of hacking the software and always trying to find your way around and circumvent the tools to get them to do what you need for <laughs> the need of, especially from kind of crazy projects, unusual projects such as Gary. That's a pretty, pretty crazy project to start your, your career on. That must have been pretty, pretty fun. Yeah, it, it really was. Um, can you share the screen? Can you show my screen really quick? I got a picture of both of them. Uh, yeah, yeah, there you go, yeah. Any of the, uh, yeah, are not familiar with it. So this is the, uh, this is the Walt Disney Concert Hall. It sits up on Bunker Hill in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and then this is the Ray and Stat Ray and Maria Status Center that's in uh, MIT. So both of these are, are Geary partner projects. Uh, and then uh, the other projects I ended up working on in the office just are ones that are more uh, non non rectilinear, more more freeform curved geometry stuff is kind of where I ended up ended up working. So what ended up happening was because I started with that mentality of always in 3D, always uh, think about how to, like you said, go go around the traditional means and make things work. When Revit hit the scene and we were using it on more traditional rectilinear buildings, courthouses, you know, whatever it might be. My initial thought was how far could I push this Revit technology? And so since I had that background in modeling in, in Katia, I decided to take Revit and see how far I could push and model something that was not a building component. And right at that same time, the new massing tools came out and I modeled an elephant in Rabbit, but picture of that. And yeah, that, that's one of uh, your famous uh, projects, isn't is, it? <laughs> it is. Maybe this is not the best view, but <laughs> this I modeled inside of Revit. And and so so that that experience made me always think about how can I push software to its limits? How could I use it for things that wasn't intended for? Was always in my brain. But was, what wasn't in my head at the time is which what I have a philosophy for now is when I modeled the elephant, I never, I always just thought I wouldn't share it with anyone. I would just, I just pushed it to its limits to see where it would go and then be able to use it within the office. Well, uh, I happened to mention to Stephen Stafford at the time, who was a publisher of the Augie World magazine, I mentioned that I modeled an elephant and he said, well, you got to write an article on it. You got to tell everyone I did it. <laughs> And I was like, why would I do that? Like, why wouldn't you do that? I was like, ah, you're right. That's a good idea. So I wrote an article on how to model an elephant in Revit. Uh, and then Autodesk picked it up and called me and wanted me to teach their development team how to model the elephant in Revit. And so uh, it definitely got its 15 minutes of fame. And this was way back in 2009. 2009. Wow. Okay. That's kind of a OG material right there. It is OG. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And so, uh, so, so that's kind of when I started to think, you know, maybe when I learn something and I push something to its limits and I, I try to break it down to be more simple, maybe I should be teaching it. And so from that point on 2010 or so is when I started really anything I learned, I started to try to digest it into simple packets and then start to try to teach it so the first avenues were through uh just writing articles etc i wrote, wrote dozens of them uh and then eventually uh they invited me to teach at Autodesk university uh and that's where i started uh that was in 2012 mm -hmm. and so in 2012 i started teaching Autodesk at Autodesk university on how to do these things as well as at the the uh the build conference which was formerly the revit technology conference yeah, so your first time at one of these conferences was 2012. Did you have any prior history of public speaking before that, or, or that was just natural? Yes, thing? yes, that's yes, not okay. that's not entirely true. I uh -huh. did attend Autodesk University prior, and someone asked me to be a co-speaker, and I did. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I didn't really know about public speaking. What 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 happened to me with the public speaking side of it and my development with public speaking, and I, I rarely share this story, but it's it's a good we're re- mentioning it, is um it, I do I do have an image here of some of the classes I taught. Uh, but I've I've taught probably about 30 unique ones now at different conferences for the last 12 years, is um, the only time I've ever been to a conference was technical structural engineering conferences where um, you present a paper and then you you present your research and they tend to be a little more on the dry side. <laughs> and so mm-hmm. in my brain, I thought that's how conferences and that's how presentations are supposed to go. It's supposed to be very well structured. You give the information, very technical Maybe there's a question or two and you leave. Um, and so that's how I did my first presentation. And uh, when I got the reviews back for the class, they were way below average. And mm-hmm. I was like, well, I just, I've been doing what I thought I was supposed to do. Mm-hmm. And then I realized, you know, what I didn't do was I wasn't myself. That wasn't me up there. Uh, I, yeah. I was really more excited about the material. Yeah. Let's model an elephant. Let me show you how to, let me show you how to shave this and do that. And then, and so 2012 came around and they told me, why don't you present your material? And when I presented my material, the first class I ever taught was how to, how to model um, uh, com- complex geometry. And it was actually my first class, at, uh, my first real single class. Mm-hmm. And that's what I did. I just poured all my passion and love out in the class, uh-huh. got the class to interact. Yeah, you and be yourself. that's when I, yeah, and that's, and that's kind of the, the, the brand I have, but it, it all comes from a place of honesty and from the heart. Uh-huh. And, and that's how I interact with people. And that's how I interact with stage. So I was just being myself. And so, so that's kind of how I, I do my presentations is that kind of very energetic, interactive, uh, excited, because that's, it's all truth. And that's, that's how I feel about it. And so, so no, I didn't have any public speaking mm-hmm. experience. I just said, I'm going to be myself. And that's, that's really where I, I, I draw from. Yeah, well, you've been an inspiration on all your talks. Like, I just love the constant enthusiasm. So I've been trying to do that in my presentation as well. And yeah, it's true that you can see that some speaker, maybe people that don't have a lot of experience, they're almost speaking like they think people expect them to speak. Do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm, a, yeah. I'm at a very serious conference. I got to be serious. I got to talk about this topic and be very precise about it. But so I think you can overthink it and be stuck in your head. And it's, it's better if you like you just let the passion out. That's right. And yeah, I think so. And conferences don't tell you how to present. Right. Mm-hmm. So they're not telling you how to present. So that's that's really up to you. That could be your creative piece mm-hmm. of, of, of the little imprint you put on your class. And and I always tell this to everybody you're the subject matter expert of yourself. No one else is. And so, you know, that you're the one that knows that material. You're the one that lived it and been through it. And you're the one that's, that, that's able to, to, to tell the story and be passionate about it. And and it's easy to, it's easy. It's an easy place to start. Yeah, for sure. I also yeah. think that at an event like this, there's always a ratio of like entertainment and information and you, you got to find kind of the right balance if you go too much for information over entertainment, I don't mean you have like to bring in costumes and stuff like that, but like keep uh, being, keep in touch with, with the crowd and the public and look them and make sure they're still engaged. Uh, so you got to keep, keep that right. <clears throat> yeah, it, it is a very careful balance. I always thought of presenting is like um, improv. It's like improv, a magic show, um, a technical <laughs> presentation, you know, it's, it's all of that in one. Yeah, that's right. And, and it, it, it's, it's, it's a difficult, it's, it's certainly a difficult balance, but, but in the end of the day, the whole point of you being up there is to disseminate that information. And if, if you can find ways to disseminate it and people to absorb it, then you've done, you've done what you were supposed to do. Well, I, I'm glad that you got, you got the ask to share your elephant early on. So I'm, Telling the audience right now, if you have an elephant somewhere or something like an elephant, I just mean by that something really cool you did with the tools. I, th- I think you should share it if you can, of course, if there's no confidentiality and like great things can emerge from that. That's certainly right. Yeah, certainly. And, you know, because of this, uh, the elephant got its 15 minutes of fame. And then if you, if you, if you, 
if you were to to look at some of the history of of when I did this, it was controversial. Half the people said it was amazing. The other half <laughs> said, "Why would you ever do that inside a Reddit?" Yeah, yeah. You know? I stayed away from those conversations, and uh-huh. I said, "The whole point is that you could do it. You can have a debate of if you want to or not, but you could. It is possible." Uh, and then so after this, uh, Autodesk actually came up to me and said, "You know what? We have some new." And I, I don't think I've ever told this to anybody. Um, they said, we we have these new wall layering tools that we're putting, you know, the wall layering tools in Revit, uh, you can layer, they haven't always been around, right? They were in development, I think 2010, 2011, where you can, you can show the layers of walls, right? And as parts, that's it. I'm thinking parts in Revit. Are you with me, Nicholas? Yeah, 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 yeah. They said, we would love for you to build a cow and we could layer in the walls and show the functionality of the parts within a cow. Can you model a cow for us? I said, absolutely. <laughs> the next thing I modeled was a cow. Uh, and actually Autodesk asked me to do this uh, about a year later after she held it. And sure enough, it worked. These are actually Revit walls on the cow. They're basically the mass surface with walls hosted. Really? To them. And then by parts, so you can actually pull the layers off and show the different, uh, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> All, all yeah. the internal organs of the, of the cow. <laughs> I, suppose, I suppose, but anyway, maybe a little too much information. But but uh, it it just kind of it just kind of went on from there. Uh, I started so then as I moved through, I started moving away from kind of showing families uh, because you can only get so far with showing families. And mm-hmm. then I started working in more like more practical stuff. How do you uh, how can you make your project more efficient? Things like that is is after kind of we got through the the kind of crazy family modeling phase of what I was doing, maybe 2013, 2014, when I started getting into, okay, this is how you can make your project more efficient. And around that same time, that's when Dynamo popped on the scene. And it was very exciting because uh, initially when I saw Dynamo, uh, I thought a lot of the stigma around it was that it was only used for complex geometry, et cetera. Um, And so I made it my mission to show how we can use it in a very practical sense, even if you weren't doing something else complicated. So that was kind of the next phase of my of my journey yeah that, that's right you were known uh for your dynamo tips i think i even saw john pearson uh, known for uh, the rhythm nodes that saw he, he got into dynamo after uh, watching one of your session <laughs> that's right yep, pretty amazing since he's created so much for the dynamo community now he so has, we, yeah you don't know how much one thing can lead to another and just just how much sharing can uh how much of an impact it can have Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the point. Right. And, you know, I'm so proud of John. If it just took if it just took watching it, one thing I did to help inspire him and, and do great things for the industry. That's a, that's that's a, that's amazing. It really is. So that I, I named the, the title of the session 12 years worth of Dynamo and Revit tricks. And part yeah. of it was you did an Autodesk. Well, you did so many Autodesk University sessions and one of them was called like nine years or 10 years of tricks. So can you explain uh, like the the idea behind that? I can. So in in twenty so, uh, yeah. So the evolution of the classes I was teaching was uh, like complex families, and then some practical project stuff, and then moved into Dynamo and showing how to use Dynamo to 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 make your projects more efficient. Um, I was about eight years in, so we're at twenty eighteen. Yeah, we're about 2018, 2019. Um, I thought, you know, I've been doing this for eight years. There's a lot of content. There's about 25 classes I did. I really need to find a way to summarize this. And so uh, I was invited to talk at the Washington, D.C. Revit user group. And I said, what am I going to talk about? They're like, why don't you talk about all your classes? And I was like, oh, it's a good idea. So I actually summarized all my eight years and I smashed them down into one hour. And I gave the presentation and I thought, you know, there's something special here. So then I proposed the class at Autodesk University in 2019. Uh, it was called Eight Years Worth of Dynamo and Revit from one speaker in an hour. And I went through um, basically the highlights of the classes that I did. And it was really popular. So Autodesk asked me to do it again in 2020. But we are now in a virtual setting, right, during the lockdown. Yeah, I remember. I think I watched again. that one. Yeah, it was 2000. It was uh, labeled 20 it uh, 10 or years worth or something. Yeah. Yeah, 2020. Yeah, 2020. I spoke at that one too. Yeah. yeah okay. 
uh, and then uh, popular again. Uh, and then, so then I asked me to do it again. So then in 2022, I did another one on, on uh, 12 years. And, and what, <laughs> what typically happens, excuse me, when I, when I teach a class is I'll have about four to eight examples of that particular topic. So when I did these summaries, I would do like two, two topics out of each class. So I would have to do about 25 to 40 examples in one hour. It was a challenge for me, but I, I was inspired to do it. And you know what inspired me to do it, Nicholas? I actually never told anyone this. Yeah. Was um, I watched, I went to the Star Wars uh, convention <laughs> back in 2016. And I saw this gentleman go up on stage and do every line from all three <laughs> original Star Wars uh, episodes, uh, four, five, and six. Yeah. yeah. In 90 minutes. <laughs> everything out it's like oh that's impressive wow. I'm like i wonder if you could do something like that uh, in our space and so that yeah. was kind of my attempt yeah, uh, you're a big star wars fan isn't it like like me show your your main camera so we can see your uh, lightsabers in the background oh. there yeah <laughs> a big uh i suppose <laughs> yeah <laughs> that is my lightsaber collection back there yeah yeah <laughs> uh, yeah yeah <laughs> so, that kind of that's what inspired me to do it actually uh, that's and so cool. it's, it's that, yeah, it's actually been great because it helped me summarize. It actually helped me uh, condense some of the databases. And actually, what happened as a result of me condensing them down was I was able to um, take that content and half of it, the I I pieced out the Dynamo, and I was able to put it in these one-page summaries. And then during 2020, I started actually writing the 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 book you mentioned which is the dynamo and grasshopper for reddit mm -hmm. book so that was actually the start of the book so the least thing i do kind of incrementally inspires me to do something else and so that's that's was the that was the start of the book actually. so uh, all right so obviously we're not going to uh to be uh, able to talk <laughs> 12 years worth of content but i thought it would be nice if you highlights some of it and maybe like if you have some links that people can go and have a look at, at it all would be good uh but if you can just give us a quick highlight reels of whatever you you would want to talk about okay so uh i think the best thing to do is i can summarize um yeah are you showing uh, my screen uh yeah uh, i'm seeing although there's some kind of gray bar on, on the screen i don't know if you're seeing it or it's just on the, on my side like there's some sort of uh gray overlay on the screen do you want to st stop sharing and try again? Just to, maybe it's. Uh... Is that better? Uh, we still see it. I don't know what what it is. Okay. Okay. Hold on a minute. Yeah, I can do that. Let's see. Yeah, no problem. M meanwhile, I'll I'll have a quick glance at the chat. Yeah, that that's strange. I'm still see seeing these kind of a. Uh... Yeah. I can... Anyway, try sharing again, and we'll see. Uh, people in the chat are saying, somebody says, I modeled a TWA terminal in Revit. Alas, I cannot share the model. Yeah, that's the problem with NDAs and confidential projects. A lot of great information can be shared. Someone modeled a dinosaur in the lobby of the power plant hotel in Sav nice. Savannah. A dinosaur in Revit, never thought of that. Catherine is asking which cut of Star Wars, <laughs> the original Star Wars, the, the guy uh, had the lines from. Uh, it was uh, the original, <laughs> the original, original one. trilogy. The uh, three, all three movies, the original trilogy. Yeah, we're actually s still seeing, like, I don't know, it's kind of these gray bars on your screen. I don't know what that is. Mm. Yeah, you can, are you moving them around? What is that? No, so that we're still seeing it. Yeah. Hmm. How big is it? Is it significantly big? <laughs> uh, th I think we should still. It gets kind of a mostly top right corner of the screen. So if you share mostly on, on the bottom left, maybe we'll be fine. Okay. Okay. That's we'll live that. streaming, folks. Maybe we'll. Uh, maybe you can prop it and post or something. Um, I'll show bottom. I'll I'll scroll the bottom left. How's that sound? Yeah, that's that's all good. Like over there, can you see this? Over yeah, there? yeah, we we see it. Yeah. Okay. Well, 
Okay, so um, let's do some quick highlights uh, with the with the the twenty years. So you saw some of the families. You saw the the the, the elephant and the cow. Yeah. Uh, okay, so um, let's talk about Dynamo. This was the first Dynamo example I ever showed. That uh, that John as well as a lot of others basically the light bulb kind of turned on with how powerful Dynamo could be from a practical standpoint, um, and with just for six six nodes in Dynamo, basically all this does is it takes. Um, we had projects where uh, we would get the walls uh, from from the architects, and then we would need to adjust our bottom of our column to match the bottom of the wall. We would have. We would have hundreds of step walls and thousands of columns. So we used to have to do it manually one by one. We'd have to like read the value of the bottom of the wall, then type it into the bottom of the column. Well, now with uh, with Dynamo, um, you can actually control one parameter to another, even through different families. So that was kind of the big breakthrough I thought that was. So, so just with uh, these six nodes, um, you basically select the columns and then and then uh, you select the wall, you read the value at the bottom of the wall, and then you basically set the bottom of the column to the bottom of the wall. And then this dynamic this dynamically runs so that any time the wall changes, then the column would automatically update and change. Uh, and so uh, this works for a, a wall that's within your project or a wall that's actually linked in from another project, which is even more powerful. Because you know, we update the link and then and then all of a sudden the columns will shift. Uh, and we found out that the architect <laughs> liked to move the wall a lot uh, during the design, just, just as it is. Classic architects. Classic architects, right. You know, I used, to, <laughs> I used to say, well, I bet each time the wall was moved, the architect would read the soils report from cover to cover and the civil read the entire civil drawing and then make the decision. Not so sure that was happening every single time. But anyway, it is what it is. Uh, so this type of thing, saving many hours and this is just one example and so with an example like this uh if you show how to control how to read one parameter from one element and set to another it doesn't have to be a wall and a column it could be a it could be a windowsill and the top of a door or it could be whatever to whatever and, and so that's kind of what that's kind of what these are is they're they're examples but they're more they're basically concepts basically how to get and set parameters in Revit. So this was basically the first one. Uh, and I, I use this all the time because that that really was a lot of very eye-opening. Uh, I also did a, so before, but let's back up a little. Um, the topography tools in Revit are much better now in 2024, but I had to teach a bunch in 2023 and, and before on the topo tools, they used to be those mesh elements. So I ended up having to model a bunch of complex ones. Uh, there was the Batmobile things like that. But this is less relevant now because now they're actually solids. Uh, okay, we talked about the cow. Oh, there's the cow. See the... Uh, <laughs> see the That's the interior. <laughs> since they're walls, they actually can host. Is it, is, it the, actually, is it the brick texture? So it's a cow made of brick in the insides? That's right, yeah. <laughs> and, and since these are walls, you can actually host doors and windows to them. Uh, if you look if you look, this is actually how the cow is made up. It's actually made up of a series of profiles Oh, that's take that's one continuous sweep um, from the back all the way to the front of the nose. That that's how it gives it that like nice smooth texture. Uh, if you end up breaking it up and you have these parts, it kind of looks like a like a toy. It doesn't look more organic. So that's how you can do more organic shape and rivet. Uh, so I taught the the kind of the modeling how to do that. Um, I taught. Um, Wait, can you see the the. Can I see the, the the windows and the cows again? I think that's funny. Absolutely. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. They're right there. Yeah. We need a building like that. That that should that would fit fit well in Vegas, actually. It would, wouldn't it? Right. <laughs> it would work. I'm sure, I'm waiting for the. I'm waiting a steakhouse. Oh, that'd be a good one. <laughs> that'd be a good one. Um, okay, so before we get to Dynamo again. I actually taught a class on how to animate and rotate families inside of Revit. Um, and uh, and basically the principle is really simple, is they're just a series. So if you do a lot of family modeling and you have to do a lot of rotations, sometimes the rotation, if you use 
reference lines in an angle between them. Sometimes they're not as stable at zero and 90 and 180, uh, Nicholas, especially mm -hmm. around 2D components, you can break down. So I thought, well, why, why fight it? So uh, I came up with this method. If you could just use a series of circles, um, could use a series of circles and then just host a point on the circle. And then you can nest all these circles together. And then you can get this uh, more complicated joint motion uh, for more complex families. Now this is for, an, this was for uh, adaptive and massing environment. But if you were using the traditional um, family editor, you don't have circles and points, right? But mm -hmm. um, but what you can use is, see if it's in here. I used it on this one, but I don't, I don't know if it's in here. Uh, in order to in order to animate in order to animate a family like this, this was done in the traditional family editor. Is instead of using a circle, what you have is you can use a a revolve uh, element. So the you can you can model four different elements in families, right? So swept, swept blends, etc., and a, and a revolve. If you use a revolve, you can actually open up a revolve, and then you have a clean surface to host to. So if you can have a clean surface to host to. Then you can you can run a, a parameter on this face and this face, and then you can basically rotate any angle you want. So that's how you can do more complicated rotations, and you can even nest them together to do more complicated rotations for classic families. That's how I do oh, like bifolding doors and things that. like that. Yeah, yeah. It just it just kind of a way of of kind of thinking outside the box, so you're not always using the two reference planes. And I told people when they found this out. I said, don't go change your families, but if you want to give it a try, yeah. then certainly it, it's... Yeah, typically easy. when I have to use rotation parameters, I model a family as... A, it depends if it's the entire family, part of it. If it's the entire, I would use uh, work plane based families, uncheck always vertical, uh, host it on the reference line, then you play with the line. But it's it's kind of, it can be kind of a hassle sometimes. So I'd be curious to try that out. Try the Revolve, okay. Yeah, uh, and then everything I'm talking about are all embedded in the classes that I taught at Autodesk University. So all you would need to do is go to AutodeskUniversity.com uh, and search my name, and then you'll see all the classes. They're all there with the data sets, et cetera. If you if you want to actually see it, kind of, kind of in action. So so then uh, let's go ahead and get back to. I'll, I'll add the links uh, later, later on. I promise. Okay. So then let's go. Uh, I, I, Marcelo, I just had an idea. So I don't want to break uh, the, the flow of the conversation, but what? what if you try sharing the, the PowerPoint screen instead of the uh, the entire screen? I'm just wondering if that would maybe remove kind of the weird artifacts I'm seeing. Oh. Uh, people, while that's going on, having a look at the chat. Is that any better? Uh, that's loading. No, we st I still see them. They're even bigger, bigger now. It's like there, there's like elements from the other screen. Oh, is this it? Can this move? Is it moving now? Yeah, it's moving. Oh, I know what it is. I got it okay. now. I'm okay. with you. I, I see it. Okay, I can handle that. Hold on. Now I know what the problem is. I got it. I got it. <laughs> what is that? That's our talking window. Oh, okay. Put it way off. Is that way better now? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Like, there's still kind of a horizontal bar. Maybe that's like the the share thing or something. Oh, do you have like one big screen? I do because uh, oh, that's why. The... Yeah. Is that a little better now? That's much better. Yeah, yeah. Like the, now it's on top, so we see almost the the whole screen. I see the problem. Yeah, normally I had run two monitors, but today I'm only on one because I'm on a. Okay, anyway, let me reshare. Thank you. Now I got it. Okay, here we go. Better? 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 Uh, yeah, it's better. Yeah, much better. Okay, so then um, okay, so then that's kind of talking about uh, families. Uh, we talked about rotation method. Okay, Dynamo. Okay, let's move into Dynamo just a little more. Um, so then, uh, so then uh, with Dynamo, uh, let me see, I can get some more examples here. So Dynamo 2, um, we... Uh, you could also use it for annotation. Uh, and so in, in Dynamo, um, when you want to take all your notes and move them to uppercase, or maybe you want to take all your sheets and move them to uppercase, or all your views names and move them to uppercase, um, you could actually use Dynamo to do that, two, four, five. These five nodes right here, uh, basically you select the um, all the text notes in the project, and then basically you move them to, to 
to uppercase and then you write them back into into Revit and then it'll change them all to uppercase. Now you do have a you do have the 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 uppercase possibility in Revit, but you basically have to click into each individual text node. Is that right, Nicholas? So if you want to do the entire project, every single text node, then uh, Dynamo is really there to be able to help you. And why would you use Dynamo? Because of this node right here. And this is the whole point of Dynamo. You see this string to upper? This string to upper is something that Dynamo has that Revit does not. And so uh, when you think about using Dynamo, if you're not a Dynamo user, you're trying to tell someone what Dynamo can do, it not only can help automate things, but it can actually expand the functionality of it too. Um, so for example, in this particular example, um, this one actually takes families and it'll find if they have embedded DWGs within them. Um, all you do is two, four, six, eight. These eight nodes, basically you select the family and then you basically check, you basically extract the geometry, check if it has a mesh. And if it does, then it'll report which families actually have the mesh. And then you can see which ones have Im embedded DWGs. And so, what do you do if, if they have embedded DWGs, you get rid of them? Well, that's up to you, but at least uh -huh. you know which ones they are. Yeah. So in this case, these are the ones that don't have, and these are the ones that have it. So once you once you have that information, you could then just like the, the whole point of Dynamo is that the information constantly flows from left to right. So now, now that you have it, that's the easy part, right? So these have meshes. You could connect this off to a, a delete node if you wanted to, or maybe you connect it off to a move to a group or move to a family set, or or maybe it connects to a to a to a to a log file that then you could see who actually made that element or put it in at a certain time, you know, and then you can go discuss that with that individual. You know, the point is is that you have it. Because just by looking, visually looking or visually clicking on families in Revit, you don't know which one has an embedded mesh, but you can use Dynamo to dig down, extract the geometry and then tell you which ones do and which ones don't. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty smart. And, and for the, the text, I, I do remember like doing this manually. And I'm not sure why I didn't use Dynamo at the time. Like that's kind of a while ago. And now I probably find, find an automated way. But <laughs> I'm sure a lot of people have memories of doing this uh, this in a manual way. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that that's the idea with Dynamo. So, uh, okay, so these were kind of like ways to do like, okay, you can get and set a parameter. You can you can do annotation. You can change notes. You can you can also um, examine things, right? Um, and then, so then, um, that's kind of the, the dynamo side of it. Now, what I then moved into was talking about a lot of companies that I was working with were taking a lot of their designs in Rhino and trying to get them into Revit. And, and a lot of times in order to do that, people were bringing the Rhino file into Revit as a DWG or as unintelligent SAT, or basically remodeling from scratch. Uh, I mean, I think we're all kind of guilty of that. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so sure. this was okay. So now we're let's see where are we at. We're now 2018. Uh, the McNeil company with, that makes Rhino said, you know, the way we're going to solve this is we're just going to take the entire Rhino program and we're just going to stick it in Revit. That way, <laughs> anytime you want to. Anytime you want to get geometry from Rhino into Revit, it's already running within Revit as a big add-in. Then you just need to transfer the geometry through Grasshopper. So then at that point, I said, okay, I've used a bit of Grasshopper, a bit of Rhino before. I'm going to learn this new technology. And so I learned the new Rhino Inside technology. And basically what it does is, I'll give you an example here, is uh, the technology basically uses uh, Grasshopper as the conduit to get your Rhino geometry into Revit and it could bring it into Revit as native Revit geometry. So in this particular example, well, that's probably not such a good one now because it is, uh, let's see, here we go. Let's give another one. Uh, here's probably a good one. Okay, so basically um, you have a Rhino solid which could represent a floor, right? And then in order to get that into Revit, you basically um, extract the geometry out of Rhino, bring it into Grasshopper 
and then um, you create the this with this particular component. They're called components in Grasshopper. So Grasshopper, Grasshopper is another visual programming language, but it's for Rhino, just like Dynamo is a visual programming language for Reddit, for the most part, if you're not familiar with it. Okay, you basically have this special node called Add Floor, and then once you get the geometry out of Rhino into Grasshopper, then you can build a Revit floor element that's based on the Rhino geometry. And this is not an unintelligent SAT. This is not an unintelligent DWG. This is actually a floor element. And these are these are dynamically linked. So anytime the geometry in Rhino changes, it will automatically update and change Revit. So then I realized, so then I started going through more examples here. Uh, there's There's a lot of things you can do. Um, to build like ramps, uh, et cetera. I do topography, so, but now they're solids. So, I do have a quick question. Do you, do you need yeah. to learn Grasshopper to be able to use Rhino inside? Not necessarily. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. For the most part, you uh -huh. do. Okay. Uh, you you do, but uh, I I would I would like to say that um, learning Grasshopper is just as easy as learning Dynamo. Um, yeah. So, for yeah. example, to convert this Rhino geometry into the topography element, it takes one, two, three, four, five, six components, and that's all it is. Um, so it's really not that difficult. So then once I started learning this technology, I started teaching it. But then I realized, wait a minute, there's a huge overlap between Grasshopper and Dynamo. And... I wonder what they look like when they when you do the same tasks. So what I did was I went back and I started going through all my classic Dynamo examples. Like, uh, let me go find one. Like uh, this one. Mm -hmm. Remember we talked about this one? And I said, okay, what would that look like in Grasshopper? Mm -hmm. Could I recreate what I just did with that classic example, but do it in Grasshopper? And I said, absolutely, I could. Because they also have a set parameter component in, in the new Rhino inside technology. So basically the same thing. You select them, you convert them to grasshopper geometry. I know you don't need to convert to geometry. You select the wall, you select the column, you read the bottom of the wall, you set it to the bottom of the column, and it does the same thing here. So these are actually one-to-one -one comparisons. And then I started doing that with a lot more ones. So like this builds, this is Dynamo building levels in Revit. This is grasshopper the Rhino Insight technology building levels in Rabbit. So then I said, okay, what if I did every single example I ever done in Dynamo, like Grasshopper? And I started doing that, and now we're in the lockdown. Now we're at 20, 2020. That's what I did. I just started making all these examples. I ended up having hundreds of them. And I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take that Dynamo book I thought of producing, and I'm going to actually take it one step further. And I'm going to produce a book called the Dynamo and Rev, Dynamo and Grasshopper for Revit. And I'm and since it's in these one-page formats, I called it the Cheat Sheet Manual. And that's what I came up with this book. So in this book, it looks just like this, where on the left side you got Grasshopper, and on the right side you got Dynamo. And that way, if you a beginner in Dynamo or a beginner in Grasshopper, you kind of see the equivalent. And what gave me this idea too was um there was a movie I watched called The Terminal where um, Tom Hanks was the character. Are you familiar with this movie, Nicholas? He was uh, I'm, I'm not sure. He was stuck inside an airport for months and months, but he could only speak mm -hmm. one language. And he found a tour guide in his language and in English. And so for months, he just went page by page <laughs> reading the comparisons, and he ended up learning English enough to communicate with people because he had these two side-by-side -side documents. And I thought, uh -huh. if we had these two side-by-side -side documents, maybe maybe we could teach either the grasshopper community or the grasshopper could learn Dynamo, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then that's why I produced this. Or you could just learn Dynamo or you could just learn grasshopper, but you have the option. <laughs> so that, that's, that's how it was the kind of the birth of this book. So now we're, now we're in 2020, right? Yeah, I like the inspiration for it. So just to get, get this clear on the left it says rhino inside revit so are is this do you use rhino geometry at all or is just that you could basically use grasshopper 
for Revit without having needing kind of Rhino geometry? How does that uh, work? Good one, uh, Nicholas. That's a very good question. That's a very good question. Um, you could use Rhino geometry, but you don't have to. So, in this particular example, there is no Rhino geometry involved in any of this operation because it's only because Grasshopper is the one selecting the Revit element. Grasshopper is the one selecting the Revit column, selecting the Revit wall. Grasshopper is the ones that's getting the parameter and setting the parameter. There's no geometry in Rhino that you have to deal with in this particular example. But there are times when you could use the geometry, and that would be, for example, like we just talked about, which is you could have a you could have a surface that represents a topography. You could then get the geometry from Grasshopper, from Rhino into Grasshopper, and then get it into Revit. But it's not absolutely it's not absolutely necessary. So, so that means that someone who has some uh, grasshopper experience and random experience, and now is moving to Revit and say, "I don't really want to learn Dynamo," you could, in theory, could use Grasshopper with Rhino inside and uh, work this way in Revit, right? To to some extent, and let's talk about that because this always comes up when I talk about Rhino and mm -hmm. and Revit. Let me just find it. There is a there's a graph in, there's a graphic in here because it always comes up, which is um, Rhino Insight is still in its infancy. Um, and so if you open up Grasshopper and you look at all the components that are Revit related, it, this is an old slide. It's, it's about 400 now. So there are about 400 elements, um, that are, uh, that are Revit related for, for Rhino Insight Revit. Dynamo has tens of thousands of them because because of what's out of the box plus what the community develops. So Dynamo is way more developed than Grasshopper for communicating with the Revit database. What Rhino Inside does a really good job of is taking Rhino geometry and getting it into Revit. That's what it is really, really powerful of doing. What it is not so powerful of doing is doing things that's just strictly Revit related. So that would be like um, mm -hmm. getting text parameters, uh, um, doing annotations, uh, you know, things like that, uh, uh, um, grabbing sheets and manipulating sheets and things like that. So, so there is an opportunity, and that's a very good question because this comes up all the time. And I didn't want to get into it here, but you brought it up, so I have to say it. This is the way I look at how Rhino Inside and Dynamo work together. You don't scrap Dynamo, but there's there's scenarios where if you have Rhino geometry, you use Rhino and Grasshopper and Rhino Inside to get it into Revit. And then once it's in Revit and you do your production work, your sheets, your stuff that goes out to the client and the building department, then you can have Dynamo pick it up and then move it on from there. This seems to be the most efficient way of kind of using these two together. Rhino and Grasshopper, Rhino and Rhino Inside and Dynamo will never replace each other. They they complement each other. Of course, they overlap. The circles overlap a little bit, but not a whole lot. That that All helps. right. That, that, yeah, of course. That that's uh, super okay. helpful to understand. So, and yes. what are the differences that you would say in terms of uh, the technical or philosophical <laughs> differences between Grasshopper and Dynamo? Are they pretty similar? What are the main differences? Okay, um, they are fundamentally they are fundamentally different, um, but like I said, they have those overlaps. Uh, so I'm just I I, I just got to go back to this graphic here. This is the best place to use the two technologies. Is, is mm -hmm. what I'm gonna say. Uh, Rhino Grasshopper has been around a lot longer than Dynamo, so yeah. there's a lot of component there's a lot of add-ins to it to do a lot of additional stuff, like structural engineering, things like that. Um, Dynamo has been around a lot longer to work with the Revit database. So it depends on what you want to do and how comfortable you are is when you're going to know where its limits are. But they are fundamentally different programs, even though they are visual programming languages. Like Dynamo is technically, Dynamo is technically a scripting language tied up in in boxes and wires like every single component every single node in dynamo is basically a script mm -hmm. like elements set by parameter that that's a, actually a script that got condensed down into a 
component into a node. Grasshopper does not work like that. It does not work uh, based on scripts. It is truly a visual programming language. It is true, truly boxes and, and wires is a good way to kind of explain it best I can. I know I'm going to get in trouble for simplifying it like that. But. Uh, all right. So <laughs> I got to get the book now. <laughs> uh, and so what's the name of the book again? Uh, it's called the uh, Dynamo and Grasshopper for Revit Cheat Sheet Reference Manual. Uh, all right. I'll, I'll add the link to that too. Uh, so there's okay, one so, more thing I've been chewing yeah. on that I'd like to share. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. Sure. Go so, ahead. Uh, so another thing I've been doing lately is, so now we're in 2022, 23, 24, is I've started going into generative design stuff and and where you could actually run a bunch of different scenarios. Um, and um, Grasshopper as well as Dynamo both have this capability. Uh, Grasshopper has Galapagos, but it does have a few others. Um, Dynamo has something called generative design for Revit, which is actually in Dynamo uh itself uh, but but basically um it's a way of so so for example i'll give this example here's one example for structure is we have this problem where we have these curved roofs and we are only allowed to use these straight segmented beams because they have already been fabricated as straight and they're sitting in the warehouse so we have the ability to tuck them up under the side of this but we can't curve them because they're already existing but we can cut them and weld them so basically, um, each one we can use up to three per per bay, okay? And there's there's like forty bays, and there's like forty bays this way and forty bays that way. So there's like there's thousands of these points. Anyway, so uh, with generative design, which is kind of the next step of of the visual programming, is is you can you can manually kind of end up tucking these in as best you could using sliders. But if you use something called generative design, then it can calculate all that for you. It could basically run through all those tens of thousands of permutations and come up with a solution for you. And so in this scenario, I said, okay, I want this to be minimized by, by as close as you could possibly get it to the underside of that particular surface. And so, so if I were just to run this uh, really quick, I'm not gonna show you, just, just to kind of give you an idea of how some of these things work. Generative design could also not be used for structure, but for laying out rooms, paths, you know, uh, I don't know, uh, optimal desk locations, things like that, whatever it is. But you're basically minimizing or maximizing something. So in this scenario, let's see if I can get it to go. There you go. So you see it's kind of chewing and working. It's trying to run through those tens of thousands of permutations, right? And then eventually it's going to come to a solution that's going to eventually tuck it up, up against up against here. I think I picked the wrong slip. There we go. That's a little better. Yeah, it's a different solver. So it's just basically going to run through all these different scenarios and it's eventually going to get it. So it's going to try to minimize it and kind of tuck it right up under there. And if it was one bay, you could just kind of slide them around. But what if you've got like tens of thousands of points that you have to move? This could really help you. So I've been involved with the generative design stuff. And then another thing I've been doing lately too is some of the AI generation stuff using kind of the open AI API to to help with some like text searches and things like that. So those kind of the newer things that I'm that I'm involved with. I'm yeah, stop the solver now. But okay, fascinating stuff. So maybe we can close on that. Can you tell me more about what you do with uh, OpenAI for your work? Yeah. So um, I so um with yeah. So the idea is uh, with with OpenAI. Um, what's really good are the large the large language modelers which basically can take, um, it could, you could put text in and it could search through documents and give data out. So, so that might come in the form of, uh, um, we're doing some early testing, but, but of course security and accuracy are always, always at the forefront of what you have to consider. Uh, right. So, um, we're at the early stage of doing some testing with, with these open APIs that can use the large language models to do it on a data set. So it could be something as simple as typing in, give me all the lengths or give me the total length of every beam in this particular project. And then that's your prompt you type in, it'll go crawl through, it'll grab all of the beams, it will then calculate the lengths, it'll then it'll then sum them up and then pop them back to you. Or uh, tell me tell me how many walls are in the project or or 
tell me the code that that this that this specification is based on or you know th things like that so it's a it's chat bot for a project basically right is what is, yeah it's the early testing that i've started to do, yeah yeah time. that's that's what i've been thinking about a lot and with the discussions with people it's almost all project might have their little chat bot can ask a hey, what is the record requirement for this so it can be like ask about specific things in the model but can be even more abstract like about the, the project and with the norms and the building code and this uh, all the requirements and it's almost like you have like uh, a member of the team that knows everything about the project and you can talk with natural language to uh, to that bot that's right that's right Nick. and what's exciting is is we technically could do that in, in the past you know mm -hmm. maybe prior to 2018 but it would require someone to write a specific script or code mm -hmm. that would go in and do that. You're like, yeah, right. Give me, a, give me the count of all the beams. You would have to physically, mm -hmm. someone would have to physically lay out those nodes in Dynamo or components in Grasshopper or write the code in the add in. And then you can write. But then the very next line could be, give me all the walls. Well, now you got to write a script that gets all the walls. Give me the code. You got to write a script that searches for the code. So these large language models could work such that you, it works globally, like you said, on on basically most things that you wanna you wanna ask for, and that's that's what's exciting because it's gonna take a lot of the busy work out of what we do. Yeah. Um, and I think right now, what's good is it's good at querying, but what it tends to lack right now is creating. Yeah. Because yeah, because like you, it's a little harder. It's easier to say, give me all the. Give me the count of all the walls in the project. That's yeah, yeah. That's I, would, I would be a bit nervous to ask uh, ChatGPT, can you create this and that? Uh, to like, Ugh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to mess up my model. <laughs> right? When you write to it, there's security, accuracy. Yeah. But also there's there's what, what and I'm going to get in this to when I do the webinar, is there are, there are our, our infrastructure of our software right now is not really set up for that. Mm -hmm. Like, like if you want to change the database, basically the APIs that do that right now to expose that are kind of line by line specific things. You can't just access the entire database all at once. You know, like like within Revit, for example, you just you just can't go to an Excel spreadsheet and see everything. It just doesn't work like that, right? Mm -hmm. So being able to write like, okay, give me draw ten walls, uh, space ten feet apart in Revit, right? Like, like, that is a much more complicated thing to do. I think we'll eventually get there. But yeah. the good thing is, is right now, there are some ways we could we could utilize this technology. And looking in the future, it's just going to get better and better and help us help automate kind of the busy work, what we do. And that's what's exciting about it. Yeah, something I saw was the idea of uh, AI agents. It's, um, it's in addition to just being a chatbot, it can actually open tools like book hotel reservation or planes for you and uh, shop for this and that. And for AEC, it could open software, do this task. It, it sounds almost scary when it's saying it this way. Like you could, it's easy to imagine how it could go rogue, but it's definitely something that's coming, I think. Yeah, it's it's scary. It, it is scary. And the way I think about it is it's probably going to be harder to get rid of it than it is to <laughs> try to yeah. mitigate and manage it, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's going to be like Clippy, but it's going to be able to open Revit and open uh, Rhino and do some Grasshopper on the side. <laughs> yeah, and you know, all this all this new technology, which is the GPT stuff, is, I mean, all it does is it tries to fill in the blanks. It's much more sophisticated now, but I mean, we've been using this technology all along, right? I mean, you send a text, right? And it tries to fill in yeah, the last uh, word. Yeah, autofill, yeah. Yeah, it's just, I mean, Google, that's all this is. It's just autofill. Google really is. complete and all that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's basically autocomplete, but on a much bigger scale. That's <laughs> what it is. Uh, just glancing at the chat. Uh, question from Scour DX, regular of the okay. show. Uh, he, he asks if you try to do some backward compatibility with uh, Revit using Rhino inside Revit. So I don't know what that works like. Revit to Rhino and then Rhino to Revit from a prior One, version of it. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. One hundred and twenty percent. So. Uh, let me give you one quick one. I got one right queued up right here. Here's one quick one. You got? Can you share my screen? Yeah, yeah. This is even easier. So 
we have a Revit, and I built this. I built this Rhino inside of Revit. So this is a Revit family. It's a Rhino animal inside of Revit as a Revit family. Okay, so it's a Rhino inside Revit. It's kind of part of the joke. But anyway, if you <laughs> want to get this geometry into Rhino, you want to go from Revit to Rhino, then it's just two simple components. You basically grab it and you convert it to Grasshopper geometry, and then you bake it in. So this is it. This is the this is the Revit Rhino inside of Rhino, and look how good it converted it. It works. It does really well. So yes, absolutely, you could go, you can go that way. In fact, I do that all the time because I like the way Revit builds stairs. I know a lot of people don't, but I like the way Revit builds stairs better than Rhino. So I will build a like if I'm building slabs. I'll build a stair in Revit and then I'll convert that stair to, to Rhino geometry and then stick it in Rhino as a reference. And now I can see that 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 geometry in Rhino. And then I have to build it in Rhino. I build it in Revit and then I just converted it into Rhino. And then away I go, you know, grinding away on Rhino stuff. Does that answer that question? It, it does, yeah. That's pretty fascinating. Yeah, I, I've played a bit with, uh, I know if you tried Speckle, it does kind of similar thing. It brings the, the geometry to the web. And you can then push it to different versions of uh, multiple tools. It does, yeah, yeah. And if you kind of think about it, this is kind of a more sophisticated from one software to another specific. And the mm -hmm. reason this is so stable above anything else, because this is you have been able to do this in the past through add-ins and things. The reason this is way more stable is because the people who built these components are the McNeil folks. They're the ones who who built Rhino and own Grasshopper. So that's why it's much more stable now than it has ever been in the past. Uh, all right, so I think okay. uh, we should b bring this to a close. I'll okay. just br uh, briefly mention a couple of things before uh, closing. Uh, okay, so once again, bimpure.com, the new website. I've been working on this for years and along with a new course called Herrick Families bimpure.com so you can see what is upcoming super hyped and excited about it uh so get on the wait list please and along with the herrick family's course and the next episode is going to be two weeks from now uh same time it's going to be with brenton weiberg second time on the show and it's uh, going to be about electrical outlet revit families so if you want to do electrical plans in revit especially from kind of a design and architecture point of view, um, where it's not our specialty, but we still need to do electrical documents sometimes. And uh, Brenton has made some great families for it, so he's going to demonstrate them. That is two weeks from now. I'll announce the episode soon enough. Uh, back to you, Marcelo. So you have a few things you mentioned, all the AU sessions. So the title of the show is 12 years worth of Revit and Dynamo tips. So if someone would want to go to the, the catalog and explore everything you did, that would just Google your name on Autodesk University? That's right. Yeah. Okay. Other than those kind of new things I showed with the general design and AI, yeah, it, it's all there. 100%. And you said there's a webinar that you're doing soon about AI yes. stuff. That's correct. That is on. What is that? Um, that that's on, uh, that's on uh, January 18th, uh, noon Pacific time. 18th is, is that tomorrow it's tomorrow <laughs> and it's uh, wh where is that webinar mm -hmm. uh you you uh that is put on by a global league training uh, global league training okay yeah they're going to be hosting me so you can you can look on my linkedin profile i put a post about it also you could go to global league training's uh, website find it there and register and you could join the discussion there oh uh, yeah, yeah okay i'll see it i'll try to add all these links uh, into the show um so thanks to everybody in the chat and thank you so much, Marcelo. That was amazing. Thank like you. It, it feels like we're just getting started. So we'll need to do another session at some points. Certainly. Nicholas. And there's so many you, topics Nicholas. we could cover. Nicholas, I want to yeah. thank you for always bringing great content to the community. I really appreciate it. Uh, the community does. So keep up the good work, okay? Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, this is so fun for me. I get to talk to experts all over the world and I get to, to it publicly. Hopefully I, it, it does inspire people. So. A closing word for me would be uh, share your elephant. <laughs> uh, as you mentioned, everybody has something cool they've built. If you can, of course, there's some confidentiality issues, but uh, share it. 
who knows who that can inspire and how that can make the industry evolve. So, so these are my closing words. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. See you, everybody. See you in two weeks. Bye. Thank you.